Okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar with Crispin Given. My name is Pat Bono, president of New York Bee Wellness, which is an independent, educational, grassroots, charitable 501c3 non membership organization. Its mission is to educate small scale, sideliner, and beginning beekeepers. We do have a YouTube site with past in person and online presentations. New York Bee Wellness also sends out newsletters several times a year, and we conduct statewide surveys twice a year for non migratory beekeepers in New York. Welcome, Crispin. Glad to have you present and um, doing this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Pat. And I look forward to talking to the New York Bee Wellness Group. Um, sorry, I can't be with everybody in person. Um, I'm coming to you live from our molecular bee lab this evening. So I've been engaged in honeybee breeding now for about 18 years at Purdue. And I'm gonna give an overview of that process that we've done in selecting for this trait. And I'll also cover briefly some other behaviors that are of interest that kind of lead up to this. Okay. All right, I got this meeting. So breeding for resistance, it's a process. So the first thing you need to do is you want to decide on a trait or a phenotype. And you want to develop an assay and measure foundation population and then select from that. And then use controlled mating using a design. And then you want to evaluate, document, and verify. So breeding versus queen ring, what's the difference? A lot, sometimes people confuse these two. Basically with a honeybee breeding program or some type of paradigm, you need, you need to have a, a process of traits or characters that you wanna select for. So it could be something as simple as the color of the honeybee or um, disease resistance, like resistance to chocolate, whereas Queen rearing, which most people do here in the US and abroad, is you simply just want to produce a large numbers of healthy, productive queens that beekeepers can use in their colonies. So healthy, productive queens is one of the most important factors to have in a honeybee colony if you want to have a successful breeding program. So just having a great queen makes a big difference. Um, many years ago, Dr. Rob Page mentioned um, his mentor, Harry Laidall Jr., who is the, considered the father of honeybee genetics. He was saying that just having a great queen is probably 80% of the process. And then the other 20%, maybe we can influence that through breeding, through selecting for certain traits. So the fundamental principle is that the offspring need to resemble the parents. So you want to have some consistency through time. So if you start with a population today, and you know you can expect you know decent results within you know three to five years, depending on the traits that you're selecting for. So you want to see you know consistency. So for example, the progeny, the color, the temperament on the comb, etc. So public enemy number one, we all know, is this, the Varroa destructor. And I won't talk much about that because I'm sure most of you are aware of it, but it is still the biggest problem. So where did Varroa come from? So they came from Asian honeybees, Apis sorani. So these bees have dealt with Varroa for many years and they have developed mechanisms to resist the mites better. So they're good groomers and the mites are only able to successfully reproduce in the drone brood. And the drone brood of this bees is interesting. It's this dome shaped like our European bees, but there's a little, meant little hole on the top, which is interesting. So they're able to have a 
symbiotic relation or happy, they can live happily together. Whereas the bees we're looking at today are Europeans. We need to select to get to that point, but it's going to take time. <clears throat> so decline in U.S. beehives. I mean, when I was a kid in the 70s, it was easy keeping bees. So the biggest problem was just trying to find new boxes to put, put your swarms in. I mean, probably, you know, six percent, 12 percent was pretty much the highest we experienced back then. But through time, you know, once tracheal mites came in and varroa um, decline in populations grew. And then, of course, the so-called CCD 2007. <clears throat> I just put this up here to show how alarming this is. I mean, we are experiencing levels of mortality that exceed 40%. And this has been going on for the last decade. So this is a problem. And as I mentioned, Varroa is a, the main factor, but there's other factors. Of course, there's you know pesticides, uh, loss of habitat, modernity, you know, we have all these new subdivisions popping up and uh, farmers are plowing their fields as close to the roads now. We don't have our, our uh, fence rows anymore and things like that. So there's a lot of factors that are attributed to this. Uh, surveys from the last decade, colony losses of all the factors that could be measured, the presence of varroa mites is the most correlated with winter mortality. And I might add, it's, it's not only the mites, it's, it's what we don't see that's causing a lot of mortality. It's the viruses associated with the mites. Because the mite is like a dirty hypodermic needle, and it vectors these viruses into the, the hemolymph for the blood of the bees as it's eating them, feeding on the fat bodies. Uh, Many behaviors are influenced by genes. Um, here, a few of them here, stinging, pollen, foraging, undertaking, uh, hygienic behavior, brood rearing traits, swarming tendencies, propolis collection, honey, and even learning. So here's some behavioral defenses, put up a few here, because this is what I'm interested in is, is looking at ways to combat the varroa mite through behaviors. So we're all familiar, I think, or most people are familiar with general hygiene. And we also have the varroa sensitive hygiene and there's um, grooming behavior. And here at Purdue University, we've been looking at grooming and mite biting, but primarily the, the mite biting behavior. And there's undertaking. So hygienic behavior, Sometimes this gets confused with VSH, but this is just general hygiene. So the idea is, is you, you want to test your, your best queens or your favorite queens if you can. And what we do is we test our instrumentally inseminated queens with this. We want to check their progeny. So what we do is we just use some soup cans. Um, you can take both ends off and about 250 mils of liquid nitrogen. And this is the freeze kill root assay. So you put these cylinders in here and with plastic foundation, it's much easier. So you just twist it into the mid rip. And once you twist it, like maybe halfway, you stop. If you twist it too much, it can leak out and, and skew your results. And then about 24 hours later, you want to see something like this in your colony. Now, you can also cut out a piece of comb and place it in your freezer overnight and put that, reattach it into the, to the uh, surface of the comb. And it, that works well, too, because not everybody can get liquid nitrogen. Uh, so hygienic behavioral is, is a hairball trait. Roth and Bueller found this. Uh, years ago. So this is something that can be selected for and it's something that's relatively easy to keep in your population once you have it. Um, another behavioral 
mechanism. Um, is SMR, how many member, I'm sure some of you remember the old SMR, the suppression of mite reproduction. And then they changed it to the VSH, growth sensitive hygienic behavior. So this is the ability of the bees to detect anomalies in a brood, you know, disease or infected pupae and remove them. So this trait is what we would call an additive trait. So there's several genes working in concert. For example, you might have one bee that comes by and recaps, and another bee comes by and inspects the cell and determines that the, the pupae or even the larvae is not infected, and then they'll recap it. So you have some bees that recap. So this picture on the far left here is this geographic look. You see some of the cells that are raised. Those are cells that they determined were okay. So it's interesting that they recap. <clears throat> So John Harbo here and Jeff Harris, they're the ones that um, were the genesis of this and selected out this trait, the VSH. And how they did it in the beginning, I'll just briefly mention, Jeff was telling me they made these mega packages. So they had like a, I don't know, like a hundred pounds of bees that they did. I mean, I think they made several of these. So then they allocated out bees and um, from many different sources, and then they put them in these packages, and then they make colonies and start selecting from those. So it was a lot of work in the beginning, very tedious. Um, another example is response to pollen hoarding. So Dr. Rob Page did this for over 30 years, and he found, you know, that you can select out, you know, for high, they call this bi-directional breeding, so he had to have a high low and, a, and a, a high strain and a low strain. So we, he would look at those. And this was more so for scientific curiosity, but it was interesting through the years, all the results he got from that. So this is something that can be selected for too. So colonies that, that have too much of a trait, like this is an example of a frame that has the high pollen hoarding trait. Or it's kind of, you can think of that as a syndrome. So what's going on here is you have a colony, it's in a single deep and there's just very small amounts of brood and there's large amounts of different pollens in there. So these colonies aren't productive at all. Um, now grooming behavior, we're going into looking at um, the mechanisms behind this a little bit and um, Ernesto Guzman and Miguel Archilanova, they found that grooming behavior is important. So Miguel and Ernesto's study in Mexico, they found that grooming behavior was important and those with the lowest infestation overall had low adult infestation. They also had the most chewed mites on the sticky boards. So mites chewed in the hives, they had Russians unselected and they had a high low generation one and high low generation two. And then they use Africanized bees because African bees are also good groomers like Russians. They're already decent groomers without selection as opposed to say Italians. So in the second generation, you can see that the portion of chewed mites was higher. And when they looked at the mites in the brood, they were relatively the same. But if you look at the mites on the adults, the low group had fewer mites. So there was a response to this selection for this trait. Um, this is our 24th year of selection here at Purdue. Um, so in 1997, we just started with BSH bees. Uh, we also got Russians, and we had stock from a wide geographic range, different beekeepers, so-called survivors. Um, bees that they thought did well in their area, and the, most of these bees were acquired from the northern part of the U.S. Uh, we also measured the mite drop and the strength multiple times in the year, uh, the honey yield, um, and we just tested best sources for BSH 
and hygienic behavior. So the temperament was a factor that we looked at because nobody wants me and bees to work with. And then general disease resistance. And then in 2007, we were, was in a lab looking and I noticed some of the mites were chewed. And so Greg and I started selecting on the uh, mite biting traits. So we started selecting for grooming behavior and then we also select for chewed or damaged mites because we noticed some of the mites that we were looking at under the microscope show damage or missing legs or uh, um, bitten sections of the idiosoma. And of course, strong overwintering ability, general disease resistance and comb temperament were things that we looked at also. So we've measured the rural populations with sticky boards. That's how we've been doing it. So we put sticky boards in for two days and then we bring them back to the lab. And then we assess the number of mites on each board. And then we look at the proportion of two mites on each board. And we also do alcohol washes now. We've been performing those since 2019 on all the colonies. In the past, we just did a few colonies. Uh, we, in the past, we extracted survivors from a house. Of course, any bee that makes it through the winter, that's a survivor, right? Um, but we did this, we did cutouts, and uh, we took bees from beekeepers, hives that weren't treated, they claimed, and survived the winters. Um, so collecting and counting chew mites is tedious and time consuming. Unfortunately, I have an undergrad that, that help us do this every year now. So we basically bring all these in, all these mite boards into the lab and then we have to evaluate the grooming behavior. So what we do is we remove the mites, we place them on glass slides on their backs so we can see the presence of chewing much easier. Because if you have them on the ventral side down, it's much more difficult to uh, see that. So here's some chewed Indiana mites. Um, I like to see it when the shell, or the shield of the mite is chewed, as you can see here. But most often we see legs missing and so that's a pretty classic mite biting trait there. Uh, here's Greg Hunt. He's working, looking at the, uh, the mites here. And here's what they look like after they've been collected and put on the slide. So as you can see, it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of time. So each one of these glass slides represents a colony. So we put, a hundred mites on there. So if a colony has say 300 mites, we arbitrarily only collect a hundred of them from that colony put on the glass slide. If it has a hundred mites only, then of course all the mites are placed on the glass slides. And here's another picture. It's kind of an abstract image. Here's a really nice uh, photo here we got of showing the appendages missing. You can see here very often the uh, petty palps are, are missing in legs. Uh, here in the center, you can see you know, the center portion of the shells missing. So I like to see that when I bite the shell. It seems like it's more aggressive um, behavior and response to trait. So some challenges with the chewed mite assay is you need to have enough mites. So often in the springtime, we don't really see that many mites. In some cases, there's none because most of the mites, once the colony goes back into reproductive mode, 80% or more of the mites are gonna be under the captains. And so that's a problem. And poor repeatability, sometimes there's unknown factors 
that cause an uptick or a reduced amount of chewed mites in the colony. Then there's correlative traits or correlative characters that can also so, you know, affect the trait. And of course, history of the colony is a big factor. So if the colony was split or if you made nukes from the colony, that's gonna put a break in your brood. And that's also gonna put a break in the, the uh, reproduction of the varroa mites or if the colony swarmed or if it superseded its queen. So these things need to be recorded in your notes that way we know exactly what happened. Uh, you need to have enough colonies. So if you're seriously thinking about starting a bee breeding program, um, it's good to have at least 100 colonies. So this is one of the challenges for a lot of people. They don't have the resources or the time to manage that many colonies effectively. Uh, you need to try and control the matings. So try to flood your area with your type of drones that you have. And that really can help out a lot. And mark the queen so that way you know if there's an unmarked queen in there, for example, you know that it's the daughter. I've had it many times where I just, I'll have daughter of the daughter. It'll be two, two replacements in one year. So that happens quite a bit. So keeping good records is important. Uh, we, we use high to high chewers and then we cross those. So the one, the best ones, the high to high, the best, the high miters, mite biters against the high mite biters. So we, we cross those two together. So we use controlled mating with instrumental insemination. So this is paramount. You need to, if you really want to control, unless you, you're fortunate to, to have a isolated area or an island, which we aren't. So we have to perform instrumental insemination. But this can also speed up the trait selection too. So daughter queens and drones are gen gener generated from those queens that are produced. So how do you choose the parents? You need to evaluate and keep good records. Uh, how do you control the matings? You need to perform instrumental insemination and have a good drone source for flooding your, your mating yards. This can really be, you know, this can have, have a big influence if you have a large number of your type of drones. And you can do this by putting drone comb into your colonies, your favorite colonies, and that, that increases the chances of those queens mating with your type of drones. Uh, you need a trait you can evaluate, something that's beneficial and something that's heritable. So the take home message with this talk is these traits are all heritable that I'm talking about. So you, it's possible you can select for these from your bees that you have in your backyard. So start with bees that have good traits for your area. So here's what we do every year. I, I paint mark, I like to paint mark the drone sources. That way I know what lineage they're from and the age of the drones. And typically this catch them on the wing as they're returning to the colony and then bring them into the lab to pull the semen from them for inseminations. So here's a look at the paint mark drones. So I could mark, you know, a couple thousand drones within about two hours. I typically do it in the morning. They're not as runny in the morning as they are in the afternoon. So they kind of have a photo period, even when they're young, they're more excitable in the afternoon. So in the morning they're sluggish and drones are slow to mature. So it's easy to identify the ones that have emerged within you know, the last two, two days. So this is just a picture of our new glass colonies that we use. So we use three framers and five framers, standard length frames. And that way everything's standardized. So selecting for mite biting is 
consider, you can say it's a hierarchical selection. So we measure proportions which you might if we eliminate those that show disease or did not control the mite population growth. And we also eliminate those that do not pass a freeze kill hygienic test. And then we select our breeders based on that. So for me, bee breeding is, is kind of a road with no ending. You can't sit back and enjoy the fruits of all your hard work because certain traits can be lost quicker than others. And it's kind of like walking a tightrope. Also, you have to keep your eye on the rope and keep your keep balancing yourself. And it's easy to fall off and lose traits if you don't. So constant selection is the key to any honeybee breeding program. So something else we do is we evaluate our II queens. So over here we Sometimes you put them in a cage, we can evaluate, we know what uh, progeny are theirs. And we can also see, you know, how well the queen is performing herself. But in some cases, you can have, you know, for whatever reason, an instrumental to make queen, the progeny don't always perform like you want. So you can have deleterious effects or deleterious alleles, for whatever reason. But most often you'll see an uptick once you get your program started. Um, another interesting way of testing for VSH behavior in your colonies is you can take drone foundation or drone comb, put the drone comb into a colony, an unselected hive, like an Italian hive that grows a lot of mites or a colony that you know has a lot of mites. Put that in there and then once the the uh, pupae or a capped over, um, you can place that into one of your breeder queens from sources that you think are good. So this is what we did in about 48 hours later. That's, this is what we saw. So you can see there's quite a few pupae removed and, then, and you look at these white cappings here, you can see what's happened here, I call this crowning. So they've removed the wax and they're at the cocoon and they're in the process of removing those. So had this been left in another day, those would have been removed too. So this is a really good barometer for measuring your population too. Um, I threw this picture back in here. How many people have seen this? this? This is a classic VSH frame. And this is kind of VSH, again, this is in some cases you can have too much of one trait um, here, this is kind of VSH gone wild. So we got VSH in our bees and sometimes occasionally we will come across a frame like this where they're just uncapping and recapping and they're just really going to town on it. And a lot of cases, these colonies aren't as productive. Um, another challenge or problem with bee breeding is you have loss of introduced genes. So here I just kind of put through time, you can lose traits. I mean, some traits, yes, you can lose quicker than others, but within 10 generations, you can lose a lot of selected traits that you're looking for. <clears throat> so my biting is heritable trait. So in 2007, when we started selecting on my biting, we we're just around 5% and then Around 2015, we were upwards of 50%. Here, this is shows that colonies that chew more mites also have less mites in the, on the sticky parts. A few years ago, there was a paper published and bees, they bite for a reason. We used to think that when a bee bites and she, she re releases this compound, it's called 2-heptanone, and we thought that was associated with defensive behavior as being an alarm pheromone. But it turns out that it's a paralyzing agent. And so bees bite for a reason. So when we came across this, we were excited because it kind of ties in a little bit with what we're doing. So bees bite for a reason. Um, 
a recent publication. It's open access. If anybody wants to Google this, you can read the paper. Uh, we found grooming behavioral gene expression with the Indiana mite biter honeybee stock. So this, again, you can see this. Um, so in that paper, we found, you know, basically Indiana mite biters, you know, they have fewer mites than the Italians. So the proportion of chewed mites um, was also correlative. So you could see that the, the gene expression, for example, in erection one is more if the ones what were grooming more and biting more, there's, there's a synaptic response in the brain of the honeybee. So it was higher in those bees that were grooming more. And there was also a correlation to the percent of chewed mites also with the group, which is nice. So here I put a video, I hope this works for you guys. So we have two bees in here from two different instrumental and semi queens. And we placed a varroa mite on their backs. And we wanted to see how they responded in the lab. So we take the, we call these surrogate cage assays, or you bring them in the lab and you want to look at them and verify a trait. So here you can see the lime colored bee is responding more than the the green, you would think with something the size of your fist, if you relative, if you look at it to the proportion of our body, it'd be like having something as big as your fist on you, that that bee would respond. So it's interesting. Some bees just don't respond as much, and we're not really sure why. Um, we have, through the years we've tried many other assays, trying to look at other ways to measure mite biting and grooming behavior. Um, one that really seemed promising a few years ago was we were placing flour on the bees. And the first two trials, it was there was a correlation to the field, to the colonies. But then on the third trial, it was all over the place. So I guess that's why they call it research. And then we've done cage assays too where we've placed individual mites in cages and see how many they gloomed off. And we had improvised cup cages and things. So it's difficult trying to develop an assay that beekeepers can use. <clears throat> uh, one study here that kind of similar to a previous study, um, Indiana mite biter versus a tie-in stock. So we looked at the mite population growth, you know, the proportion of mutilated mites, the severity of mite mutilation, you know, winter survival, and the amount of norexin expression. So 18 colonies were split in one apiary and then sampled July 10th, only 25 days since the split, and October 11th. So we assessed for mite drop proportion of mites and the amount of viruses that were in their blood. So grooming behavior and mite levels. So here you can see in the Italians, a percent of mite drop was higher and a percent of chew was significantly um, higher in the Purdue's versus the Italians. And in October, the same thing we noticed there was more chewing going on in the selected Purdue stock versus the Italians. Uh, some viruses that we detected uh, was DWV, black and queen cell, like cyanide one and two virus was also probably. But DWV is by far probably the most devastating virus still. So DWB correlated with the mite levels. So survival as of February, the Purdue's were at 77%. The Italians were at 22%. And the Indiana mite biter, if you look at the rural population, again, it was much 
less than the Italians. Uh, if you look at the proportion of mutilated mites, and again, it's much less than the Italians and the Indiana mite fighters over here, if you look at the proportion of mutilated mites, it's less. So bees are fighting back and we're trying to just help bees through these behavioral traits to improve the health of the colony. Um, now back kind of to the fundamentals. I mean, we're also at Purdue teaching beekeepers how to produce their own queens. So it's important, you know, yes, we're doing the bee breeding and all this, but it's also important that beekeepers just have the fundamentals down, the, the practical applications of beekeeping, just taking care of your hives, uh, producing your own queens. That's very important because today's world, we're, we kind of forget about, you know, just the fundamentals. So here's a group, we have about 40 beekeepers every year that come to the university. And we teach them this queenery class. And we also teach the same class at HAS, the Heartland Agricultural Society. And this year they requested that I accept 40 students, so I have, and I have three other instructors helping me. So that's already booked up for HAS, I believe. So that's a lot of fun too, working there. <clears throat> um, this year it'll be in Vincennes, if you just Google HAS. So hope to see somebody be there, but it's a lot of fun. We just teach beekeepers how to produce their own queens and that's kind of a big factor that helps out a lot. And we also teach instrumental insemination each year at Purdue. And this is more for beekeepers that are, you know, they want to step up their game and they're serious about breeding and they've learned greenering and all that. And so this is a lot of fun also teaching them this. We also have collaborative efforts with beekeepers or we like to call them micro breeders. And one of them is the Heartland Honey Bee Breeders Cooperative. So we have like nine, seven and nine states that come to the university each year and they, we disseminate information and germplasm or cleans from our lab that they use. And then they take them back to their states and they produce daughter queens from those. So it's really unique situation where all beekeepers work together like this and bee, breed, bee breeders. Um, another one in, in our own state, we have the Indiana Clean Breeders Association. And within our state, we have these, they have a website you can go to and there's a lot of enthusiasm about queen rearing and bee breeding in our state. So this is last year's event. That's a lot of fun. Um, some future plans, uh, we're gonna do a collaborative effort in about seven states more stock comparisons. And Dr. Brock Harpo joined our lab in 2019. He's interested in genotyping all of the mite fighters. So may, someday maybe we can apply genomic selection in addition to our phenotypic selection. Because in the past we've always done strictly phenotypic selection. So now we're gonna incorporate uh, genotype. So we'll do genome selection also. So that's, exciting, um, continue teaching queen rearing and expanding infrastructure and queen production and selection. And then our, we have a PhD student, Garrett Slater, who's working on drone sperm viability and mortality associated, what genetic components are associated with those factors versus environmental ones that we're aware of that cause sterility in drones. So you can check out our website. It's the Harper, the Beehive, the Beehive, we call it. You can kind of see what we're doing here. Um, it's real exciting what Dr. Harper's doing. And it's gonna be interesting to see what's happening in the future as far as looking at genes or finding new markers associated with these traits. So I'd like to thank everybody for listening and. Just a few people here I added through the years have helped us a lot with this. So thank you very much.
right. Well, thank you. Um, can you see the Q and A box? Uh, let's see. Yes, I just clicked it. So there's a question, what kind of correlation is there between two mites on the sticky board and the number of mites found from an alcohol wash? That's a good, yes, they're most often, they're lower, but not, not always. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense at all. But we just started doing every colony that the alcohol wash in 2019. So yeah, a lot of times the colonies that have fewer mites on the sticky board also have fewer in the alcohol wash. Um, a question, this one says, are the Indiana mite biters race Italian? Good question. No, they're not. They're, they're a mongrel. They're mutts. Um, we, as I mentioned, we have, you know, we have Russians in them. We have Caucasian. We do have Italians, Carniolan. Um, so they're just a, a mixture of all. So we, nothing is pure. I mean, not, if you look at a lot of the so-called strains of bees in the U.S., I mean, Anybody that claims are pure, they're probably not. You could have like Italian looking bees, for example, but they can have Carnica mitochondria, for example. So the mitochondria comes from the mother side. So this is very often the case with a lot of whatever. You could have um, reverse also the darkest bees, they look Carnica or Caucasian, Russian, but you look at their background, the mitochondria, you'll find that, oh, they have Italian or they, they're mixtures. So yeah, cool. Um, would the Harbo assay uncapping of one of their cells look for mites be useful in allowing mite biting? Uh, no, I mean, I think the best assay is, is we have to bring the, the uh, mites into the lab and then assess the number of mites that are bitten that way. Uh, there's a question. I have seen mite biting behavior on my drop boards. I clean lineages where we all originate from northern bees. Is there anything else that can cause mite damage? How common? Okay, yeah. So is, in other words, they want to, is there something else chewing the mites? That's the question. Um, no, I mean, we know, yeah, sometimes we've seen where ants will come in, but it's such a small window of time, two days that we leave the sticky boards in. I've seen it where we've had these little tetramorium ants, a little paper ants that come in and they start chewing, they're eating around, they're attracted to the oil because we spray our sticky boards with vegetable oil. So for something to come in there and actually chew on them, they would have to go pass it up. So no, most, it's not a problem. Uh, let's see where we go with this. Um, is it recommended to inspect mites on sticky board for damage and what magnifications needed? Yeah, I, I think if, if people can take time and monitor your mites, or if you're already monitoring your mites, take the time and Yes, you can look at them. We just use like a 15x stereo micro or binocular microscope. And these are pretty cheap to get. And you could also, there's, there's also little cameras you can buy. They're relatively cheap. You can buy um, that you can look at mites too. So yes, but I think the easiest way is just using a 15x microscope. Got another question, is your group or another group selling these queens so these trees can get to large? Yeah, so I get asked this all the time. Um, through the years, again, we've been working on this long time. So a lot of this, these instrumentally instrumented queens have gone out the door through the years. So many people have these bees already. And there's some people that, um, like Dr. Megan Melbrest, I believe she, 
firsthand help. She, she offers my fighters. Um, there's many people, if I don't mention everybody, then they'll get mad at me. But there's the ones that come to mind also in Indiana, there's Dave Shenfield and many of those breeders. If you go to the IQBA website, that's probably a really good source to get them. And I think in uh, West Virginia, there's a bee breeder, Jason Bragg. He's, he's offering my players also. So let's see, here's another thing. By biting the mites, are the bees exposed to viruses? What is exposure risk to the mite biting behavior? The simple question, I really don't know, but if you think about it, Yes, there's a lot of talk going around about VSH bees or the pole lion bees, you know, or they're looking at VSH or the undertakers that are removing the bees, transferring the virus. Yes, they probably are. So are the, the bees that bite the mites transferring virus? Probably. It's, I'm sure they are. We've We've noticed that with our population that they seem to be a little more tolerant to viruses like DWV, but we haven't really investigated that enough to really find out why. But it does seem like some colonies can handle large populations of mites better than other colonies. I'm sure some of you have seen this and are looking at it. For whatever reason, that colony, which is good, so and if it survives the winter, then that could be, you know, a breeder for you next year. Um, another question, how common is mite biting behavioral in general? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I'm glad it was asked. It's very often I mention this. I've, it's, it's in all the populations of bees. No, so whatever bees you have in your backyard, they have these traits. Some of them are higher or less level. So you can select out for all of these traits and your stock from your backyard. I mean, whatever is so-called, one calls, you know, bad stock or a bee, they can be selected out in those even. So yes, there's low levels of mite biting and grooming and unselected stock. Uh, another question, is research and breeding of mite biters being conducted elsewhere in the US or Europe. Uh, we're looking that we have a colleague in University of Guelph, Ernesto Guzman and Dr. Miriam Morphin. Um, they're, they're looking at the, the grooming trait. Um, as far as mite biting, there's more so, I think on the micro readers that are actually selecting for the trait, but the grooming, Again, grooming is probably the, you know, you look at the behavior, the grooming comes first and then the proportion of chewed mites increases with the amount of grooming. So if they groom more, they also tend to chew more also. So maybe it's an additive trait also like BSH. I'm, I'm thinking it is, that's because we've discovered one gene, the Rex and one that is associated with grooming. So I'm sure there's gonna be other genes that are discovered or other markers. Um, how do you analyze for correlations between BSH or general hygienic behavior and mite biting? No, we haven't, but I, I think it would be great to offer something to beekeepers commercially that has a BSH cross with a mite biter cross. So these two behave, I mean, it's just another tool in the, the box to combat the mites, mite biting, so. And I think, are you treating for mites in these mite biting colonies? Yes, if there is colonies that have high levels of mite, like, like every year, anywhere, you know, like six to 12% I think 12% has been the most I've ever treated. But in some cases, no matter what, you know, they have all the right stuff, but the mites and the viruses tend to over, overtake them. So I, it's, it's much better to treat the colony than to let it die because 
what happens if a colony dies that's highly infested with mites and viruses. They get robbed out in the fall by your healthy strong hives. And then that goes to your, your strong colonies or the colonies that you want to survive or you think are fine. And then they end up getting sick. And many times I've seen it where a colony did die, even after treatment, where there is a neighbor effect where the colonies near that colony often die too. That's happened in clusters in an apiary because we our apiaries are kind of too big really, but we need it for bee breeding. So we have about 25 colonies to 30 colonies in our apiaries. Uh, all right, so what are your overwintering stats? So generally, you know, we, the highest loss we've had was like 50% we lost, I think back in 2004 or three, if I remember. And generally around, you know, 28, you know, 15, 28% is about what we lose every year. Um, 2021, yes, this year we, we've lost about, I think close to 30% of our colonies. <clears throat> and most of that was in one apiaries. Uh, have you looked at whether my buying jacks can help mitigate my migration in the fall. Yeah, we're in a process of kind of looking at this. Dr. Brock Harper is going to genotype everything and we're going to try and see what we can do. All right, all right. that looks like that's all the questions. Uh, Kristen, thank you very much. Great, great work. Oh, we got a few more. Do you have time for a few more here? A few more questions? Sure. Let me get a drink. My mouth is really dry. <laughs> I drank too much coffee. Let me switch this back on. All right. Uh, I don't see the, can you read the question to me? Does the high population affect the percentage of mite biting? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's, it seems like sometimes when there's, you know, more bees emerging, there seems to be an uptick in the trait, but other times it's not. Um, there's a lot of noise there. So a lot of environmental factors too might play into it the time of year, but we don't know exactly, but it seems sometimes there seems to be more of a correlation in the springtime when the when the, all the bees are emerging. It seems like they're more tuned into what we're not really sure. Okay, when you treat your hives for mites, what do you use? Uh, I like using oxalic acid. Um, we don't use the vapor; we use the dribble method. So we use like 3.5 oxalic acid to a simple sugar solution. So that's one cup water, one cup of sugar. But the problem with that is you'll need to do it when they're broodless, right? And end of the end of the year. So by that time, you know, if you have crawling bees on the ground, your colonies, even if you treat them, it's no matter what, it's not going to work. So generally I treat after we take the honey off. So the last few years we've used Amitraz, 3.5% strips. And that seems to be effective, but it's this year, I think I'm going to uh, mix it up and use something else because it's not good to use the same treatments every year because of resistance. Okay, any thoughts on what to expect if triple A ALAPs arrive in the US and if mite biters would be effective on them? Um, I've seen some really interesting videos of those and some discussion. Um, the biologically, triple ALAPs is, uh, they need the presence 
what I understand is they need the presence of brood to feed. So if the colony's broodless, the way I understand, they don't feed on the adults, but I wouldn't be surprised if they, they can feed on the adults. And um, how would they, the mite biters respond to it? If you think about the mite biting tree, this is all happening in the darkness of the colony. Um, so I would think, it, you know, these the mites move around much more rapidly than the row instructor. So it's possible they could respond more to them in the beginning of introduction, to the movement of the mite in the darkness. Um, but of course, we I didn't mention, you know, the mites are also adapting to Varroa destructor mice. So the behaviors, behavior shifts going on in the colonies also as we're selecting for the trade, but the, this unselected stocks are also expressing more grooming and mite biting through time because of the presence of mites in the history. But with tropolalaps, it's a big mystery and I'm hopeful that they won't make it here and survive. <laughs> Right. Okay. Thank you again. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again for listening.